Welcome to Diagnostic Imaging's Weekly Scan. I'm Whitney Palmer, Senior Editor, here with the top stories of the week. Even though lung cancer screenings are known to be an effective way to identify lung cancer and initiate early treatment, not all patients who could benefit from them stick with the annual screening. In a study published in the American Journal of Roentgenology, investigators from the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine discussed a strategy that can improve adherence to screening initiatives. Based on an analysis of 260 patients who returned for follow-up lung cancer screening, 43% stuck with the initiative. They found former smokers were more likely to stay with it than current smokers, with 50% of former smokers returning and only 36.2% of current smokers doing so. To improve adherence, the team suggested focusing on current smokers and patients with a negative lung CT scan, since a negative scan does not rule out possible cancer. The team recommended creating electronic medical record tracking systems that detect patients who miss their lung cancer screening appointments or offering health insurance premium reductions to promote participation. Also in lung cancer news, a new deep learning based automatic detection algorithm can improve the sensitivity of chest x-rays for detecting the disease. Not only could its use decrease the number of unnecessary follow-up CT scans, but it could also reduce the amount of radiation exposure to patients. In a study published in Radiology, investigators from South Korea outlined the efficacy of their algorithm that is designed to detect overlooked lesions. To evaluate how well it works, the team analyzed chest x-rays from 117 people who had lung cancer, as well as 234 healthy counterparts. From the group who had lung cancer, there had been 105 lesions that were initially overlooked. Nine observers reviewed the x-rays twice once with the algorithm and once without it. Across the board, the detection of lesions improved with the use of the algorithm. The observers pinpointed 53% more cancers with it compared to 40% more without it. Based on these findings, they were able to more accurately suggest follow-up CT scans for actionable lung cancers. Recommendations for additional images rose from 54% without the algorithm to 71% with it. Ultimately, the team said the AI tool could be of the most benefit to early career radiologists, as well as those who do not have thoracic imaging subspecialization. What happens next in the pandemic is still unclear, but that doesn't mean that there are not certain factors that practices must consider if they want to have the most successful post-pandemic future. In an article published in the Journal of the American College of Radiology, Past chair of the American College of Radiology, Dr. Geraldine McGinty, and her colleague from Will Cornell Medicine, Dr. Robert Min, outlined five specific indicators that will be pivotal as the pandemic recovery continues. They touched on changes to reimbursement and how practices should handle sensitive financial conversations, as well as the regulatory changes that will remain after the pandemic subsides, including broader telehealth, consolidation efforts, and downward pressure on fee-for-service rates. In addition, they discuss the supplemental, not replacement role of artificial intelligence tools, as well as the need for radiologists to identify new ways to interact, network, and conduct research and educational efforts in the future. And lastly, they pointed to the need for increased cybersecurity, not only for the radiologists who read from home, but for the patients whose scans they examine. But even among all the planning and forward thinking, providers are still focusing heavily on learning more about COVID-19 and how best to treat it. In an article published in Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology, researchers from Gemelli University Polyclinic in Rome looked into whether point-of-care ultrasound can be used to effectively identify which patients are more likely to have severe outcomes from the viral infection. The results of their study, they said, showed that bedside ultrasound in the emergency department can, in fact, predict on first evaluation the overall prognosis of COVID-19 positive patients. To reach this conclusion, they analyzed bedside ultrasound scans from 41 COVID-19 positive patients in their emergency department, concentrating on 14 lung areas. They gave each scan a score from zero to three, with three indicating the most severe disease, including white lung with or without subpleural consolidations. Overall, they said, more than 90% of these patients had at least one lung area with an abnormal finding. And among those who died, every scanned area contained a pathological finding. Of those patients who recovered, similar findings appeared in 50% of scanned areas. 
Although the study was conducted in one institution, the team said they hoped their results could be generalizable and improve the triaging of COVID-19 patients. And finally this week, Diagnostic Imaging spoke with Dr. Efren Flores, a radiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, about his recent work examining the prevalence of more severe COVID-19 disease in patients from racial and ethnic minority groups. According to the research he conducted with colleagues, there are a number of socioeconomic factors that contribute heavily to this larger disease burden in this population. He spoke with us about those elements and also discussed the active role that radiologists can play in mitigating those problems and ultimately improving patient outcomes. Here's what he shared. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Um, but to jump in, you know, why did you decide to examine the, the potential differences in outcomes for minority patients? I guess, what was the impetus for you in, in taking this, this investigation underway? It was really um, clinical observations that when, um, when we started looking at chest radiograph uh, for COVID patients, it was becoming obvious that minority patients, particularly in our Latino community, were getting hit very, very, very hard by uh, COVID-19, not only in the frequency, but also the severity. So, for example, the institution established what we call respiratory infectious clinics to uh, uh, take, uh, provide care for those patients presenting with COVID-19 to the urgent care setting. And we were establishing some of those clinics at the community health centers where we have uh, prim predominantly Latino patients, but also some around the main campus in the hospital in Boston. And when we opened the clinic, it was just, um, it became obvious, at least from the observation, I was just shocked how, how many um, radiographs from the uh, respiratory infectious clinic at the community health center were not only positive, so the positive rate was higher, but also the severity of disease on radiograph was higher as well. And many of these patients that have severe imaging findings or radiographic findings ended up going to the emergency room to be admitted to the hospital uh, with COVID-19 infection. So it really alerted uh, me to think about, you know, systematically looking at these factors and just not to only document that there were existing disparities and in, in COVID-19 um, pertaining to imaging or radiology, but also to use this information of, to guide our, um, our department in ways that we could get involved to address some of the emerging disparities and collaborate with others in not only um, efforts in radiology, but also public health efforts as well. Okay. Drilling down just a little bit into what you saw in those respiratory clinics, you know, you said that there was a high volume among the Latino population that, that had more severe disease. And yeah, I guess anecdotally at this point, um, what was the, the percentage of, of the population that you saw kind of develop or, or present with that more severe form? I mean, I, would, I don't have a concrete number in terms of percentage. I would just say that the perceived number. So, for example, if I looked at a case or on a, a radiograph without looking at where the imaging was coming from or the name, just looking at the image itself, I knew that if the patient had severe findings that were, or findings that were obvious on radiograph, more likely than not were coming from the, from the particular respiratory infectious clinic. And what it shows is that, you know, many of these patients were uh, getting um, impacted, not only because I don't, I don't think language is the only barrier. Language or what we call limited English proficiency, more so like a proxy for other barriers that or difficulty that these patients encounter, particularly underrepresented minorities. So for example, these patients tend to live in overcrowded housing, uh, working on jobs that are not conducive to remote work. So for example, in the service industry to work in the, um, in warehouses and grocery stores, also uh, lower socioeconomic status uh, prevents them from um, st um, getting a lot of groceries or storing for like, they don't have to go to the grocery store that frequency. And also they rely on public uh, transportation. So all these factors, what it increases their exposure or their risk to being exposed to, their, this, to the virus, but also their viral load. And these are probably a combination of, e of factors that really resulted in this increased severity. And the reason why we wanted to look at the patients that were admitted 
with COVID-19 because this patient, that was um, a population that we were able to confirm um, their disease and also follow up at their clinical outcome because detecting the, the COVID-19 is, for us, it was not sufficient. We wanted to see what happened next after the patients get admitted. What are the, what are the implications of seeing these findings in imaging in terms of uh, clinical outcomes, which I think is a, uh, a critical component because we wanted to further explore the continuity of, of what we were observing in radiology and how this finding in radiology was translating to not only in the severity and frequency of COVID-19 disease on chest radiograph, how does translating into clinical outcome for the uh, pay for all our patients, but particularly for on our underrepresented uh, minority communities. So then, based on that, um, what did you find? You know, what what was the the um, I guess the takeaway or the 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 downstream implications of of what you were able to gather? So what the so there are a couple of uh, take home messages or key messages from this study. One is that increased uh, severity on radiographs is associated with worse clinical outcomes. So we, when we looked at a composite outcome of intubation, admission to the um, intensive care unit or um, death patient that have more severe disease had a higher like, and this was like among both white, non-Hispanic and non-white patients, all patients that higher severity of disease was associated with worse clinical outcomes for um, all patients. However, among non-white patients were um, showing with increased severity of disease, so therefore increasing their risk of experiencing uh, uh, worse outcomes. And the factors associated with uh, this increased severity were, um, for example, uh, limited English proficiency, delayed presentation to care, so patients that were presenting later, particularly in this disease that is so aggressive, and also um, obesity, one of the comorbidities that we've seen in other uh, studies that is associated with worse outcomes, but language or limited English proficiency or having English as a second language is a proxy for other um, socioeconomic barriers that a patient serves. So because it was, if it was related only to language, then we could just translate everything and then it would be solved, that gap would be solved, but it, uh, it, it goes beyond that in terms of what language uh, truly represents and um, what other factors are associated with that language barrier that really influence how patients are accessing the healthcare system, navigating the healthcare system, but also getting timely care. And these are like COVID have really highlighted how um, what we call social determinants of health influence, directly influence um, care and outcomes for our patients. So when it comes to that care delivery and what what's the impact there? What I guess, what are the differences that these patients experience because of all of these factors that other patients might not have to, to encounter? So for example, uh, so we can start with um, language. So at, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot, there was a lot of info, health, um, actionable health information that was being developed um, very rapidly because we were learning about the disease. I think that we now have a better understanding of the, of the disease, but at the beginning, we're still learning of, of the disease, how to better prepare for it, and also, um, how to uh, protect ourselves and others in our household. However, there was a, uh, this information was not available in multiple languages as up to date as it was. So that lag in, in having ac accessible, actionable health information was impacting uh, those communities that don't um, have um, other language um, that was not non-English as a primary language. That that's one one part. The other part is that if we think about our underrepresented minority community that represent a, um, a high proportion of those that come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, those patients really had to. Um, if you think about people that live on a weekly paycheck where they have to decide, I, if I miss work, I may not be able to put food on the table or pay. Um, 
this month rent, right? So a lot of um, other big decisions had to um, be made in terms of like, either do I seek care now or put food on the table? Or if patients work um, in the service industry, let's say, for example, a warehouse or an essential worker, such as working in the service in um, a warehouse or grocery store, or getting to work on um, to that job uh, using public transportation, they were increasing their exposure to this disease. And potentially those jobs don't, don't have um, a lot of sick time or sick leave. So they were um, making a really difficult decision of either I seek care and miss work, or do I go, um, I'm, um, or I go to work and um, delay uh, seeking care, and particularly at the early stages of the disease. On top of that, if you think that people were um, considered heroes because they were coming up to uh, work, that adds a little bit of an additional burden that really they need to show up for work and um, and delay your your care when you had at the early stages. So it's probably influencing or the resulting in some of the delays of our patients in seeking care that ended up being um, coming with more severe disease at a, at, a, at a later date than compared to other patients that were not facing similar barriers. That makes sense. Um, well, then pivoting a little bit and thinking about the role that the radiologist can play, um, what can the individual provider do or the, or the teams of providers, uh, what can they do in helping mitigate these disparities among you know, patients during this pandemic? So I would say that radiologist and every uh, uh, specialist um, has a role in health equity efforts and, and, and enhancing the care for our patients. So for example, um, for radiologists, um, we see more patients than any other specialty. There's no question about on a daily basis. And as an individual provider, uh, because we're providing care for many patients and in different areas, so for example, in my experience, I was able to see patients from the resp respiratory infectious clinics at different um, from different clinics, and during my workday, but also I was able to see follow some of these patients in the in in the inpatient setting or when they were coming from uh, through the emergency room. So what it, it provides, radiologists have a very unique perspective about population health and what are the pre, some of the pressing needs in our communities because we're able to gather a lot of information or see many patients during our work day during, um, that are referred from different areas and are, or are coming to different um, points of care. So we can definitely collaborate in identifying what are the populations that are, are more, most vulnerable and collaborate um, closely with our primary care providers and community health centers to see how we can use radiology encounters as a way to not only identify emerging disparities, but also use radiology as a, a point of care or a hub to try to enhance some of the um, health equity efforts and public health efforts that others are collaborating. So it's absolutely critical that we partner with all medical specialties to work together uh, to address some of those disparities. So it may just be from providing um, actionable um, health information that is timely as it comes um, uh, up, as it becomes updated, but also we can use radiology encounters to try to provide additional um, information or resources to so for example, the community health center was um, using the respiratory infection, infectious clinic to um, address some of the social determinants of health, such as food insecurity and housing insecurity. So we partner with the um, Center for Community Health Improvement to also advance some of the initiative through when the patients were coming to radiology and also provide actionable health information about what to expect in radiology, but also radiologists can really take a, a, a lead into some of these efforts and in collaboration with the community. And we were actively involved in public ser service announcements about what to expect when the patients were coming to the respiratory infectious clinic to let them know that we were open for anybody, regardless of insurance or immigration status. 
but also radiologists were really involved in providing care uh, for those patients admitted to the hospital. And also we were part of the Spanish language care group trying to enhance efforts um, uh, for multilingual efforts for our patients that were admitted uh, to the hospital with COVID-19. So there are many, many opportunities for radiologists. It's just a matter of like stepping, I would say, uh, I would say <laughs> going beyond the reading room and just stepping out of the comfort zone and, and seeing opportunities where others don't. Because it really, um, when so many people ask, well, what is radiologist's role? Health equity is everybody, uh, everybody's duty. So what can we do to enhance that? Uh, what what can we do to really collaborate with others and um, be part of that? So I don't I want to change the narrative to um, to say not only not so next time people don't ask what is radiology's role, but like um, we need radiology to get involved in this and what is radiology um, not to define but see as a, a active partners in in this endeavor. But it's really gonna take a um, to work together in this so we cannot do it alone. So we have to collaborate with others and within our specialty to enhance these efforts and move forward. Well, it sounds like there were a lot of things that you and your colleagues did you know, to, to date so far. And I know that it hasn't been a particularly very long time because we're only about four months into, into this pandemic. But based on the, the outreach that you did and the, the collaborations that you put in place, what changes or impacts or effects have you seen from the efforts that you put in with the community so far? So, so far, I mean, overall, I think that um, the severity and the frequency of, of the disease in particular in this community have decreased. We're still very vigilant about it because we're not only concerned about the second wave, but many of these issues that have been uh, affecting this community for a long time. Um, are still present. But what I think is created a, an increase of le level of awareness in the healthcare system that is really important that um, the, um, our institution, for example, or the healthcare sector really co um, closely collaborate with uh, the public health sector to really um, enhance the care that we provide and try to address uh, social determinants of health uh, for our patients because it's absolutely uh, become increasingly um, in, um, an issue impacting our community, not only long-term health, but also our short-term health in um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And also some of the uh, programs or interventions that have been developed during COVID can, can be um, uh, done um, in the long term. So for example, our department, like in collaboration with the, what we, uh, the MESH incubator, uh, led by Dr. Mark Sushi and the uh, Radiology Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which I'm a part of, um, developed it as a web-based application that we were able uh, to provide patients that were coming for chest radiograph that speak Spanish or other languages, instructions on how to better position or how to position for their exam. So not only this has been used um, during COVID, but also now it's been expanded to other areas. So for example, screening mammography, where it's a very intimate setting, it's probably better for the patient to be given instruction in other languages by, by this application rather than having a, a, another person, a third person um, you know, as an interpreter there. But also uh, when we're offering questions about uh, the fall precautions or other questionnaires, it's easier um, for patients to understand uh, spoken language than written language because some patients may have difficulty um, with um, reading, but if they listen to it, they may be able to answer some of the questions. So not only we're addressing a language barrier, but also we may be addressing some of the educational barriers that are coming with um, overall literacy. So it's more to come, I think, than uh, some of those interventions. And more than that, it's just the close relationships that we continue to expand with the health centers. I think that have been critical. And this is important because not only isolated across in Massachusetts, for example, where we work, but we've seen that these disparities exist and have been evident across the United States. There are another, other areas that have been impacted across, and they're seeing these disparities develop in those areas, but also in other countries as well. So it's not an isolated event or incident, and any lessons learned here or other areas can definitely be shared across. Uh, practices.
Well, on the flip side of that, kind of looking at challenges that may be in place to um, radiologists being able to, to truly affect that change, you know, are there certain things that that stand in the way of, of being able to implement these types of strategies? And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, anything that, that stands from um, operational challenges to even rural location where resources may not be as as plentiful. So I think that that's an outstanding question. And I think um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned rural locations because for example, we provide care for um, one of the islands out of, uh, um, out of the Cape and Nantucket and, and Martha's Vineyard. So those are considered rural locations because of where they are. It's interesting because I was talking with one of the uh, providers of one of the islands and what he was saying that even though the Latino population is a small fraction of their overall population in the island, half of the patients admitted to the institution were Latinos, a patient admitted with COVID. So this is like, uh, not only we see it in the urban center, but we also see it in the rural setting, which may face additional barriers, as you mentioned, um, because of uh, decreased resources. So I think that one thing to consider is that many of these interventions or programs or collaboration that we develop are not only easily implementable, but are not as resource intensive and just to consider those locations as well. Because if, it, if they become resource intensive, then it, um, it's not going to be sustainable in particularly those areas that have um, lower resources. So in order for it uh, to be generalizable, it has to be uh, uh, trying to be of low impact to where you are going to implement that. But also um, a key component that is absolutely critical that as part of the developing those solutions is that we involve the um, frontline workers uh, because they keep a um, finger on the pulse on what are the factors or issues impacting uh, patient access, but also include the communities and patients in into the development of those interventions because they are the ones that are directly uh, facing these barriers. So our efforts um, have um, increased um, meaning or an impact if we really seek out active, proactively seek out those uh, collaborations among patients, um, community stakeholders, frontline workers, and um, radiologists and uh, overall the institution. So it's absolutely critical that we seek out those collaborations in order to make this effort sustainable, but also to proactively address some of the barriers to implementing these programs that may uh, come. Well then, stepping back and taking a, a I guess, 50,000 foot perspective of this, are there any takeaway messages from either your your experience in the community or from the, the investigations that you conducted that we can kind of provide um, for context, for people to understand what's going on with the Latino community and to try to address those disparities. So I think that um, one of the things that I would say like the um, take home point is that our work is never done um, until like, you know, so we can't provide high quality care until our care is equitable. So our work is a continuous process um, that there are many fa uh, barriers that are our communities, Latino community, but also underrepresented minority and other vulnerable communities are facing. Um, that, but any step that we take in the right direction to address those barriers is a step in the um, forward or um, an assistance that these patients are getting that we're not getting before. So I always tell, um, people that are thinking, where do I start? I say you can start anywhere because um, these patients are not getting um, a lot of assistance. So any assistance that you can provide is a win for them. And many small wins, even as something uh, we can say as simple, uh, we may see it as simple, uh, translating a, a document about COVID, how to better protect themselves for COVID into multiple languages. That may seem as something simple, but this is really meaningful for those patients that are benefiting from it. So I say like many small wins build up to a big win. And if you want to get involved in health equity, outreach and um, community health improvement, um, just take a step back, think about where some of the gaps your patients are facing, talk to them, listen to your patients with empathy, with compassion, involve them in the process, and then um, 
just get started. And if you feel like it, uh, many barriers to either implementation or just think through the process, I encourage people to really seek out mentorship and collaboration within the specialty and beyond, because this is what really going to enrich the experience and the work that you do. Well, Dr. Flores, I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to share some ideas and some thoughts uh, with you as well today.